Brooks was a philosopher, and the next guest was a doctor and a scientist. You're a physicist. Now, the cutting edge of science is physics. This is where most of the, uh, most of the implications of, you know, what is real reality? What's really going on? Uh, as a physicist, how did you come to faith in God, and did you have faith in God before you became, uh, as you were learning, or did it happen after? How did your, how did your journey to faith intersect with your science? That's a great question. Actually, I was raised in a Christian church, but for me what happened was my faith was much more cultural, and then after my senior year of high school, I read through the New Testament in its entirety, and I had this extraordinary transformation where my faith went from something that was just a habit, something I was brought up with, to something very real, where God had become real in my life. But I went to MIT as an undergraduate, and what happened was I was challenged with issues of science, things like evolution. I read Richard Dawkins, The Blind Watchmaker. I had lots of friends who were not Christian, they were atheists, so it really challenged me of why is my faith, uh, why do I believe my faith is true? And what happened is a general feeling among the scientific community is that you've got faith, which is something you just sort of believe blindly, or you have science, which is objective and real. And the people that are smart believe in science, the people that are kind of naive believe in faith. But what happened is I became convinced of that. And I remember a very dark night of the soul at college. I said, you know, God, I don't really know if you're true. I don't know if you exist. But just help me to know what's real and I'll follow it. And I said, I'm, I'm a scientist. It can't be emotional. It can't be something that I sort of wish to be true. You have to prove to me what's actually true. And I never really thought that God would answer my prayer. I didn't think that was even fair. I mean, you kind of have to just believe. But what happened is they put me on a journey. And part of that journey was a study of science. And what I learned was that science and faith are not in contradiction. But as was mentioned before, science and faith are intertwined, that you cannot do science without faith. Because to do science, you have to believe that the universe is orderly. You have to believe also that we have the ability to understand that order. And that only makes sense if there is a God, a creator, that designed the universe and created us in his image in order to understand that order. So, mm. for me, science actually helped to reinforce and bring me back to faith. So as a physicist, if someone says to you, uh, I find no evidence for God, what do you say? Well, I would say that the evidence, it's not that they don't find it, it's just that they have chosen to suppress the evidence. Now, the Apostle Paul, an early Christian, commented how when you look at nature, you see God's divine attributes, you see his character, you see his nature, and that it's evident for everybody, it's sort of a freebie, that no matter who you are, no matter where you live, you see evidence for God all around you. And what happens is some people will embrace that, but others suppress that truth. In fact, what's interesting is that if you go onto the university campus among graduate students, the people in Christian fellowships are very often those from the physics department. Because when you look at the laws of physics, it just screams out that there is a designer. So just let me give you an example. If you look at the laws of physics, it's very clear that they are designed for life and with life in mind. Because if you look at things like the law of gravity, you look at electromagnetism, which is what causes a, a static cling. If those, uh, if those laws were designed such that the force was stronger or weaker, life would not exist. In fact, uh, scientists have studied about dozens of parameters, uh, universal constants that are just perfectly fine-tuned to allow life to exist. So again, I would say that they're not being intellectually honest. Because most physicists who are honest say, even if they don't believe in Christianity, even if they don't believe in God necessarily, they'll say there is evidence of an intelligent designer who created life or created the universe with us in mind. So this even goes, so evolutionists would say when they try to say that evolution can account for life, the fine tuning of life goes all, or fine tuning of the universe goes all the way back to the beginning. And that singularity, as scientists call it, it's this moment where these constants and quantities are so finely tuned, so astronomically just impossible to, it would be like 50 different knobs that each independently right. have to be fine tuned. Talk just a little bit more about the fine tuning of the universe. Right, well, if you imagine, imagine that you were a creator of a universe, like you had a, a universe starter kit. And in that starter kit, you could choose how strong the forces were. So if you, let's say, turn the knob of gravity off, everything would feel heavier. If you turn the knob down, everything would be lighter until it eventually float. Well, what would happen is you would have to turn all those knobs to the exact right numbers within a very small, with a very small error, or else the universe would fall apart. 
That's the idea. Now, these knobs are not like your FM dial between 80s. I mean, this is like billions and billions of, of possibilities within each knob. Exactly right. right. Astronomically exactly right. large numbers. Exactly right. So, it's, it, in fact, if you look at the probability of any universe coming together just by chance, uh, and it being able to sustain life for anything interesting is, is astronomically small, essentially impossible. So there's a principle called the anthropic principle, and I'm going to set you up for this. And it, it, it was posed like this, that if you got to a hotel and you walked in and all of your favorite foods were in the room and your pictures of your family and your favorite shirt, uh, and you hadn't put it there, but all the things that you liked, you would know that somebody expected you. And this was put that the universe knew we were coming. Exactly right. And what's amazing about that is you see it at every level of physics. It, I talked a little bit about the laws of physics, like gravity, electromagnetism, the things that hold the nucleus together. But it's also true with the planet Earth. In fact, there's an amazing book called The Privileged Planet out there that talks about how everything about our planet, the, the rotation rate, the distance from the sun, the fact that it's tilted at a certain rate, the fact that the moon stabilizes our orbit, all these factors have to be perfectly designed for life to exist. Even our location in the galaxy, even the uh, age of the galaxy before we appeared is all perfectly designed with us in mind. Brian, when you travel in university campuses and you, you confront college students and you're, you're, uh, I, I, I've, I've enjoyed watching how they react to you because uh, you come in under the radar, but as you begin to unpack, there's no question that you, you are afraid of. What are some of the, what do you think is one of the greatest obstacles? You talked about people suppressing the truth, but what is in people's head that makes them think that no matter what a Christian says about truth and evidence, there's something overwhelming about evolution or something overwhelming that science believes that negates it. Right, and a lot of it, I think, is imagery. Because I think what's happened is if you think about the typical image of a Christian talking about science, you typically think of a movie like um, uh, Inherit the Wind. It's this picture of the narrow-minded Christian that's against science, it's anti-intellectual, trying to suppress the ideas of the enlightened scientist. That's the image. So a lot of it's just the, the portrayal. Also what happens is you look at essentially the religious gatekeepers of our culture who are the secular scientists. The people believe what they believe largely because of the authorities they trust. And if you look at the, 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 in a sense, the priest in the white lab coat who is saying that if you believe in evolution, you're smart, and if you don't, you're stupid, people buy into it. And a lot of the language of evolution creates the image that it's irrefutable evidence. So for instance, you were, use words like ancestor, you use words like transitional fossil. They all create the image that it's, it's something that's very solid. However, when you start looking at the evidence critically, when you start essentially not buying everything that's being told you, but you actually go back to first principles, what you find is the deepest assumptions of evolutionary theory are collapsing. For instance, and there's a great book called The Blind Watch, or uh, it's called Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe. He talks about as biology has broken into the molecular realm. What you find are these molecular machines which have many different pieces, all of which have to be there at once for it to function. It's so, like a Dar mousetrap. so Darwin would have looked at the cell and he would have imagined the, the cellular structure to be right. kind of like, like goo or something into like sap in a tree maybe. Yeah, exactly right. But yeah. now but what, but what we've seen when we get into that, that, that molecular level, you see this, this city, this, uni this universe within a cell. It's like, it's like you find a spaceship. If you found a spaceship with all the intricacy in the, in the circuitry, you would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was designed because nature can't produce highly complex, highly ordered structures by chance because nature takes what's orderly, what's complex, and breaks it down into simple chemicals which are very disorderly. It's like what's easier to do, to have a neat room or a messy room? Obviously, you don't have to work to have a messy room. In the same way, nature takes a very orderly cell and breaks it down into, into random chemicals. So when you look at a spaceship, because it's so orderly, you know it's designed. In the same way, when you look at the cell, it has a complexity far greater than what you'd find if you found a spaceship. So that's what we're, we're finding in nature. And what's ironic is, is that when people are confronted with that complexity, they either postulate we have infinite number of universes, the multiverse theory, or somehow that, uh, that maybe, like Richard Dawkins suggested, that maybe it's so intelligent, life is so complex, that maybe it came from outer space. Right, right. And again, that's just pushing the question back one level. Well, if it came from outer space, where did that life come from? I mean, that's the question you have to ask. Yeah. 
uh, I know you remember the book Evolution from Space, which basically said the chance that life could have arose, could, could, have, could have produced itself, was one chance in 10 to the 40,000th, and they said that's the same probability that a tornado could go through a junkyard, throw the debris up into the air, fall to the ground, piece together a 747, full of gas, ready to fly. So. That's very true. In fact, what's interesting is when you look at the fossil record, that's the record of ancient species that died and are extinct now, what you find is it looks pretty much like the book of Genesis. Because Genesis talks about how in these different periods of time, God created something. When you go to the fossil record, what you see is at different periods of time, things appear suddenly. And when something appears suddenly, it just comes out of nowhere, and then it never changes through all of life's history. So what's happening is the more we delve into science, the more it pushes us back to Genesis and the story of God's creation. So we're not, I mean, of course, evolution happens within, within species. We're talking about, we, we, we accept that species have multiple varieties and the genetic possibilities. So within species, there's, we certainly see what we call microevolution, but from, to see those changes and mutations mount from one species to another, it was Stephen Gould, remember what he right, said, that right. he said, well, uh, uh, from Harvard, he said, well, the species evolves to a certain point and then jumps to the next species, punctuated equilibrium. So, but again, the evidence is just lacking to make this amount of conclusion that instead of a common descent, maybe, or a common ancestor, maybe there was a common designer. Right, and exactly, that's a very good point. Because again, remember I talked about how evolutionists have certain assumptions? and their entire theory is built on those assumptions. One of those assumptions is that the small changes we see in nature, like moths growing darker or lighter, a bacteria resisting antibiotics, the assumption is that those small changes can uh, build over time and create large changes. But now we can say very confidently that that's simply not true. Let me use an analogy. One second here. We're going to bring you back. This is, okay. I feel like the old Johnny Carson show when we have this great guest and we got to cut you off. Thank Dr. Miller. This is an amazing time. Um, we've had a brilliant time tonight. Uh, we're going to talk more with you on another show. Thank you so much to those of you that are watching. Uh, the Newsboys are going to take us out on a song called Born Again. And whoever you are watching around the world, the Born Again experience is simply the creator of the universe that we've been talking about who exists, comes by faith into your heart and gives you a new life. Because of his resurrection, he's now alive. His spirit can live inside of you. Give your life to Christ, say yes to Christ, and he will make you a brand new person. The old is past, the new has come. Let's praise the Lord and one more time thank...